I want to say welcome. I'm so glad you all joined us today. We have uh, two really amazing people here to tell us more about our Hamilton online collection or online gallery. And in this gallery, we showcase posters in our collections and the blocks that print them. Uh, so we'll put a link over in the chat. And what you do is you can simply click on a poster, scroll down. You'll see not only the blocks, but the color separations, the makeup of the poster. And it's a really wonderful way for us to engage our community, to showcase what's actually in the collection. Uh, museums are always looking for new ways to show, share, and engage with collections. And we were really excited when this opportunity uh, came up because we have some really beautiful pieces in the collection and we want you to be able to see and explore them as well. We are also very lucky because the project is sponsored by our friends at Adobe Fonts. And it's also made possible in part through the generosity of the Wingate Foundation, the Logan Foundation and the West Foundation. That's a lot of support to make sure that we can share our collections with you. So we do wanna say thank you to everyone who helps make that happen. And the two people who are here to talk about it today are Mr. Paul Pignato and Christopher Sly. I'll give you a short introduction, yeah. Um, because they are um, really, really good at what they do. And I'm so wonderfully excited that this might be a nerdy talk. So, uh, <laughs> because these two, uh, I won't call you nerds, that's me, I'm the nerd. And I love when you guys tell us more about your process. Um, so if you have not met Paul or Christopher, Paul's our collection manager here at Hamilton. He is not always on site, um, but when he is, amazing, amazing things happen. And even when he's not on site, amazing, amazing things happen. He is a specialist in the arrangement, documentation, and preservation of objects in artistic and historic collections. His work here at Hamilton has been invaluable. His knowledge of collections management and attention to detail has allowed us to unpack, document, and share so much of the collection. So thank you, Paul, for all of that. Thank you, that's a wonderful introduction, thank you. Christopher Sly, in over 22 years at Adobe, has worked in type-related design, engineering, marketing, licensing, standards, partnerships, products, sales, and finance. Um, he acquired many skills and mastered the job. He built long-standing relationships among Adobe and its partners, and it is well beyond just what he does at Adobe, what he did at Adobe. Um, it's an amazing, amazing, breadth of knowledge that you have, Christopher. And I know you brought that to this project here at Hamilton. So I wanna say thank you so much. I can't wait to hear more about your process. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna hand it over um, and we will get officially started. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Let's see if I can do this. I think you're good to go, Paul. You want to get started? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to begin with um, sort of the background of this entire project and how it how it came about. Um, and I'm going to jump right into that. Um, that'll be just a little bit of a sequence. Um, it's going to be kind of dense in some respects. So follow along, drink your coffee or your beverage, and uh, we'll get to the good stuff right after that. Uh, the visual stuff. Um, Christopher and I, just so you know, have been colleagues for over 20 years, maybe 25 years. We've worked on different things together. We're, we're, we're close friends. And uh, it was great that the two of us could work together on this project. And um, we're calling it, um, I'm glad that Stephanie or Bill or Jim, somebody called it the online gallery because Christopher and I always referred to it as something like the color separation proof print interface component tool website integration project. Um, um, and we had different names for it at different times. Um, so it's a lot easier to say the Hamilton Online Gallery. Um, the, this dates back to um, about 2018 when Bill Moran and I started thinking about some concepts for having a solution to put um, objects and the database online for access. Um, so, uh, uh, we started thinking about things like what, what should our implementation entail? How should it look? Um, what's the best way to integrate the collection database onto the website? Uh, what's out there already? Um, and, and we started looking at examples. Um, and we also had to consider what resources we had available, what funding for infrastructure, site maintenance, the personnel we'd have available to maintain this thing. 
Um, and amongst all that, I always like to ask um, the uncomfortable question of um, why do we need this and who's going to see it? Um, so we kind of got through those preliminary um, steps. Um, so what we decided to do was to do a little bit of a feasibility study and analyze some suggested websites um, and see how they were working in terms of displaying their content from the museums. And Christopher, you wanna advance to the next uh, slide. Pass this text to me. Pardon me? Pass the text here. Yes, yes. All right, there you go. Okay. So. Um, what we started doing was, um, uh, as I said, was we started reviewing, doing a feasibility studies. And these are some of the examples of some of the sites we looked at, um, we being Bill and I. Um, we looked at about eight to 12 different sites. Um, we were kind of looking at the overall um, user graphic interface. We were looking at splash and landing pages, um, entrance into the collection database of a museum website. Um, and kind of looking at what was there and how it was navigated. Um, um, we also looked at things like how, how are they pre-populated with featured objects or uh, categories. So when you enter these sites, you know, you have an idea of what you're looking at and where you should go. Um, how much were they visually oriented? How much were they text driven by doing searches uh, via text um, and, and filters? Um, query structures that automatically got built. Um, did all of that make sense as you interacted with these sites? So we were really trying to get a sense of how, how museum sites were working and what we wanted to do. Um, amongst those, we found some really creative um, websites. Uh, Barnes Foundation comes to mind because you could do things by um, searching using art elements like color and texture. Um, Cooper Hewitt was a very interesting site as well. Very creative sort of designs to interacting with the website. Um, but all the time we, we wanted to be practical um, and think about the practicalities. What applications were being used on these websites? Um, what were the hosting platforms? Um, were they out of the box um, solutions that were driven by a standard set of templates? or could they be customized? Um, were they bespoke uh, application developments for the website? Um, and how did they integrate an existing database? So these were all considerations we were making. Um, so in analyzing the sites, what I decided to do was uh, begin charting out the navigation path. So if, uh, Christopher, you wanna go to the wonderful flowchart picture. So this is a, uh, a report from me to Bill, an internal document of me charting out the um, the actual uh, a website. Uh, in this case, I think um, I don't have my image big enough here. This is the uh, Oriental Institute in Chicago, I believe. Um, so I started looking at top down um, how you would flow through the site, uh, landing pages, query result pages. Uh, what was being presented beyond an image, what data you were getting to see about an individual object, um, and what interactive features it had. Could you magnify an image to look closely at it? Um, were there links to related objects? Those types of things. So in doing these reports over a series of about four months, uh, Bill and I decided, we discovered that we had something else in mind in terms of what we would do for Hamilton. And um, so we, uh, uh, we kind of naturally d uh, evolved this sort of idea that we wanted to show what makes Hamilton unique as a working museum. We wanted to re reflect the creative spirit of Hamilton and the people who interact with it. And we wanted to educate site visitors about the printing process um, as simply and clearly as possible. Those became objectives for what we wanted to develop. Um, we wanted to think about the audience who might who might be looking at this um, and why. So we considered students, um, printers, researchers, academia people, um, and the public less familiar with Hamilton and the printing process. And we wanted to come up with a solution of how we embrace uh, and create your relevance for each of these audiences as best we could. Um, we also started realizing, does 
do we really have to display the entire current database and make it available? Um, um, instead, what if we selected featured woodcuts and prints from the collection? Um, and this sort of led to the idea that Bill started developing about presenting the story about how a print gets made um, from a woodcut to a multicolored, multi-layered finished print. And um, we want to present that interactively and visually, um, especially for those people who aren't completely familiar with the relief printing process. So why not um, integrate it with working functions as well um, um, so that it mimicked the processes that take place in the museum where we're selecting certain designs within the collection and making restrikes like Jim does. And we wanted in a sense to document that process and use it as content in our interactive interface. Um, so that is sort of a, um, thank you for bearing with me, that's sort of a background of what we were trying to do. Um, and uh, now we're gonna move to, we're gonna fast forward a little bit and you'll see how all this links together. Um, we're gonna go right into um, our second part here. Um, Christopher, if you wanna go past the flow chart. Yep, there you go. And, and so fast forward a little bit in terms of time. Um, we're now in roughly early summer, late fall of last year. And this is where Christopher becomes involved. And I'm gonna let him talk for a little bit about our development process. And these things will link together as we talk about all of this. Yeah, I came in, uh, Paul had been, I, I'd been keeping in touch with Paul and, and Bill and folks at the Hamilton and um, got really interested in this project when Paul started talking about it. And I thought there was something to it that I wanted to help with. So um, we got to thinking, Paul and I, about um, the best way to, to kind of develop this first as sort of a proof of concept and then hopefully something that would ship. Um, the development process was kind of complicated um, and took a lot of experimentation. So it involved like, you know, photography, actually photographing objects and prints, um, then processing those, um, figuring out how to put it together into a prototype. And then um, eventually, um, because the Hamilton site runs on Shopify, um, we decided we should probably try to put it into that platform um, to sort of make it quicker and easier to deploy. Um, and then there was all, you know, some testing and things that needed to happen after that. Um, we started wondering what kind of reference images to use um, for this content. Um, we didn't have a lot of, uh, like a wide variety of content to choose from yet. Like we were sort of working with what we had and we had woodcuts and prints. Um, we really thought the woodcuts seemed to be sort of the more authentic reference because it's you know kind of where everything starts um but in the end uh we decided like a high quality print was probably a better reference and uh i'll get into why that is uh explaining our process here um this is one of the i'll start with like sort of our first experiment with this and we had this uh woodcut we had a print of this and some woodcuts um some images of woodcuts and um because all we had was a sort of the final composite print we decided we'd see what we could extract out of these woodcuts. It seemed like the right source. Um, but in the end, it became uh, sort of untenable um, to try to sort of pull a digital print off this image. You know, it seemed like a cool idea, but the more we looked at it, the more time consuming and complicated it got. Um, think about this image here. Um, there's some very clear lines. You know, you could, if you got this into Photoshop and messed around with it, you could pull probably that circus uh, print off the top, but um, looking carefully at the detail, and this is true of a lot of these woodcuts, you know, there's very fine detail that's really kind of impossible to capture in a photograph like we had. Um, these, you know, small hatches and little, uh, you know, carved valleys in, uh, are just details we can't extract out of a photograph. Um, so for this experiment, we decided we'd try to work from the print. Um, and again, as a sort of first experiment, I just grabbed what I had, um, or Paul did. And uh, we had this sort of rough image and I thought I'd see if I could simply filter this through Photoshop to get the different color ink separations out of it. Um, this is a relatively simple print. So it seemed like something worth trying. Um, 
the easiest and first thing I did was to pull the blacks out of it. And this involves opening it up in Photoshop and just filtering out other colors to get something like the black, which is, you know, a promising direction. Like here, this looks like a, you know, a, a separate black print from that woodcut, uh, but it's got problems. It's um, a little light in spots and this top part is cut off. And I futzed around with a little bit and eventually cleaned it up uh, with something that looks like this here. So I filled in some of the blacks, um, restored some of the letters at the top, that surface. Um, but in the end, we started to realize this really wasn't going to be uh, a good process for other prints um, because of the sort of meticulous nature of pulling colors out of these composite prints. Um, Here's sort of a summary of that uh, we call it, you know, uh, our first technique filtering. So it's like putting stuff through Photoshop. Um, the advantages are like that what you do pull out of it is perfectly registered. It all came from the same source. So that's good. Um, it's simpler sourcing because, you know, we just need one good color print. Um, and we have a nice reference for the original colors if it's uh, one of the original prints. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's really difficult to pull colors out uh, often. Sometimes it's impossible if it's um, something that got overprinted. Um, and um, it's less faithful to the original cuts um, and just really time consuming. Um, um, at the really end of this experiment, oh, sorry, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, let me just jump in real quick um, and say that at this point in the development of this component, we didn't know, we hadn't pre-selected what designs we'd be working with. Um, and, and what I mean by that is interacting with Bill and Jim about what actual prints we were gonna use. So we didn't know what our reference image was gonna be, whether it was going to be a woodcut or whether it was gonna be a print as Christopher said. So we tried to um, kind of get ahead of the game by saying, okay, well, let's try working from a woodcut. Let's try working from a vintage print or a restrike print. So I just wanted to interject at this point we still don't quite know what materials we're going to be working with, but we also realized we had to come up with a working workflow process to, to generate separations. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, this is just kind of what I ended up with at the end of that experiment. I did manage to get um, these three colors extracted out of the print, and it was kind of encouraging um, in that like I could overlay what I took out on top of these woodcuts and see that everything kind of lined up. It was sort of an exciting way to, to look at it. But um, really at this point, we started to um, receive some images of uh, separate prints, you know, the, like a single woodcut printed, um, you know, in one color. And uh, we figured it was probably time to look at that as a better approach. Um, here's an image of, you know, what a couple images of what I'm talking about. Um, this was a nice print, um, which I'm gonna explore a little more in the following slides. Um, but this is kind of how it looks um, when we get a, a raw photograph to work with. And these were photographs that were being shot at hand. Now, both Christopher and I are remote, and this is during COVID times. Um, and those were photographs we were receiving from Hamilton that were being shot. Some, we had existing photographs from when I was there on site, but these were all new images for us and new work that was being generated uh, by Jim uh, doing restrikes and creating uh, color proof um, separations for us. Yeah, so here's the description of that process. Um, the advantage is, is it's just a um, a more accurate representation of individual cuts. It's you know it's literally the product of <laughs> putting ink on a cut and printing it, which is great. Um, and uh, you know with Jim doing that more carefully, we get a nice clean print. It's cleaner artwork to work from that we you know eventually digitize. Um, the disadvantages is it's more work to produce those separation prints. You know, we need the original cuts on hand and, and Jim or somebody needs to make nice clean prints of them. And then once we get everything digitized, there's work to be done to um, correct, you know, geometric inconsistencies and uh, register everything together. But um, we kind of overcame that. Um, I'll talk about uh, our first experiment with that. This is um, a great print. This is the original print um, sort of cleaned up um, that we got from the Hamilton. A restrike. A restrike. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, you can look at this and it's it's beautiful detail, like a really um, elaborately cut piece of art. Um, and you can look at this and say, there's no way we're going to extract colors out of here through filtering this print. 
you know, we, we have to work with separate um, separations already. <clears throat> so back to um, this original image, this is how we start. And um, I can just run through the kind of corrections we need to do to get them ready uh, to work with digitally. Um, to varying degrees, they have these problems. Sometimes they're really nice and clean and square, which is great, but sometimes we have to, have to do these corrections that involve rotating them a little bit and doing sort of keystone correction perspective uh, adjustments, uh, unwarping them if the paper wasn't totally flat. Um, and then eventually choosing a standard size for them um, and getting everything resized to the exact same dimensions so that when we overlay them, everything is, uh, you know, lines up. And then it just becomes a matter of getting these images into Photoshop on separate layers, futzing them with them a little bit to get them registered and aligned in, in separate layers, uh, and then working with them from there. Um, let me jump in, uh, Christopher, because mm -hmm. he'll show you some examples of that process. But remember, just to kind of put everybody on the same page if, if they're not, we're working from photographs that we're receiving from Hamilton. So there was a back and forth process in working with our photographic technique to get um, to get images with as little um, issue in, in the geometry that uh, Christopher's talking about um, as possible. So we were kind of going back and forth saying, can you try this adjustment? Can you try that adjustment? Um, and we had a process of doing some, once we received photographs, I would review them, We'd look at them, send some comments back. Well, we need a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It took a lot of patience and a lot of back and forth. Um, and we're always working on that process to, uh, because if we minimize problems we have with the original photographs we're working with, it streamlines the entire process and makes it more efficient. And remember, we're talking about showing, you know, many, many images, as many as possible on the website. So um, we really want to get our process down. Um, and I thank the patience of everybody involved in that. I just did want to interject that. Please continue, Christopher. Yes, I don't. Uh... If you don't mind uh, a brief interjection. Uh, one all. of the other issues that I think was difficult for you guys is that even me sending you a good separation, a yellow separation is still, well, it's a pain in the ass. So. <laughs> I think one of the things I began to realize is that you even have difficulties there in terms of creating outlines from something like that yellow, which is poor contrast in essence. Yeah, right. And we, and, and we talked about the idea of rather than printing, uh, having Jim print his actual colors as he's working through the process to build a print and putting aside a color separation, say for the red or the yellow tiger, printing separations in just black so we get maximum contrast. So it was a, it was a sort of, you know, I don't know if we still resolve whether that's a good idea because that involves inking the plate in black, uh, pulling a print, removing the ink and going back to his process. So it, it's sort of a, we're still trying to discover the most efficient way of doing it, but we have gotten quite better about the photography's gotten better. We're getting the contrast even in the yellow, and we're kind of at a point where we can work with that. Yeah, luckily it worked out okay. I had a little concern about that having to you know deal with it in Photoshop, but um, I think in the end it it wasn't a big issue. At least it, it hasn't been so far, which is great. Um, here's just a little look at, at sort of what I end up with when I've you know, gotten everything into Photoshop layers. Um, each layer um, is a black and white image. Um, and, you know, if it's yellow, then I, I have to just shift it over to black and white, um, which gives me a, a kind of a mask um, that's transparent um, so that when everything's overlaid, you can um, assign colors to them and get a composite print. Um, I guess that was kind of a mouthful, but this is what I mean. Um, yeah, um, Christopher, let me jump in there. If you go back to that slide, this only takes a sec. Sure. Go back to the black and white slide of the tigers. Um, so this is exactly, now we're doing exactly digitally what I just suggested we were thinking about with the gym printing. So just to interject that, maybe yeah. that's obvious, but maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, this is kind of where it got exciting because um, being able to stack these uh, different color layers up in Photoshop, um, literally assign any arbitrary color to them um, usually we used, you know, the most, most faithful color we could. 
but it gave us a lot of flexibility to um, try different things, um, switch uh, the layers around, um, and um, essentially, and also clean stuff up quite a lot. And we got, um, had a little debate about how much really to clean things up because once it's in there, you can make things really super clean. But of course you don't want to sort of squeeze the life out of it. So um, an interesting process trying to work out um, just the right balance of all that. Um, and this, uh, in case it's not obvious, um, is the result of um, that Photoshop composition. So um, it looks very similar to the restrike that we saw a few slides back. Um, but it's a great result. And obviously, uh, I think, obviously much better than uh, the kind of result we got with that first technique of like trying to filter uh, ink out of a composite print. You know, having the separations printed separately was really kind of an eye opener. That's right. Um, and here's just a few more um, images uh, from the uh, batch we initially did. Um, the tiger and that other one I showed uh, first were kind of our prototype jobs, but eventually we did more. Um, these are kind of interesting. The rhino, I think, is a good example of something very clean. Like it's got really big, bold color fields. And um, it's kind of nice to go in and clean up flaws, you know, like take out scratches and kind of make the yellow solid yellow. Um, we we're able to do that with the Granol Opry poster here too, which interestingly had a halftone plate and uh, which came out really cleanly once we got it in there. And we were able to make the colors more solid and, and just kind of restore it in a way. Yeah, um, so so what you're looking at in this slide, these are all the digital restrikes, if you will, from our work. So we're going again, just to, to summarize, we're going from uh, images that we're receiving from Hamilton working on the separations, and then Christopher's going through a, a process of realigning, of separating, realigning, and relayering. And this is all gonna be relevant in a second because we're, we're preserving each layer and that's where the interface on the website comes in as you'll see in a, shortly. But also I, I wanna just suggest here, maybe we'll come back to this in the sort of concluding or in the question and answer period. Remember, now we're, we're in a different realm. We've gone from an analog print, and now we're completely in the digital realm. And questions start rising about, um, OK, how authentic do we want to be? We have these digital documents now, and we can do lots of things with them. Like Christopher was saying, clean up any saltiness in the print, um, make the halftone look a little bit cleaner. Sometimes, Jim, sometimes these these woodcuts are warped. They're difficult to print and get even. Uh, we can correct for some of that depending on what kind of source material we get. So keep that in mind as we move ahead and we do need to plow through, Christopher, let's keep going. Yep, uh, good point. Um, so from here, we uh, went right into doing, uh, building the prototype. So just a few slides to sort of talk about that process here. Um, we moved everything into uh, Adobe XD in this case um, to sort of uh, have something we could present um, for approval. Um, that was sort of the end result of these early experiments is like, let's build what this app would look like um, and see if it's good enough to proceed with. So um, the interesting thing about this image, I think, is that um, the process really does involve generating every possible color combination uh, as a separate image, which is relatively easy to do once it's all in Photoshop, but it's still um, uh, it takes a little time and effort to spin everything out. Um, and there are pictures of the woodcuts that go into the prototype. Um, and uh, so all of these uh, is, uh, create sort of a time consuming effort, but um, it pays off in the end. Um, <laughs> I, can, uh, I can step through the prototype. This is very similar to the online gallery, but these are actually screenshots from our original prototype in XD, um, just to step you through um, our thinking, um, this original, sort of browser view and then selecting a print, which gives you some uh, information about it um, from Paul's database. And uh, from there, you can go on to explore the image. Um, and uh, here you get this interface with that shows the woodcuts and the inks, uh, sorry, the prints. And uh, you can check them off and sort of build the print virtually um, and see how they combine and layer um, one by one here. Um, building up to the final print. 
But the fun thing about this, obviously, is you can um, uh, take out other uh, colors arbitrarily just to see how the combinations look and kind of understand how they layer and combine to you know, create uh, the final image. Um, we also had a facility to look at these in greater detail. So here you can like click on an image and get a nice detail uh, to examine uh, a little more closely. And, and again, remember you're toggling on and off um, the color layers that you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, included the woodcut images as well. So these uh, were um, photographed on site. Um, Paul processed them all to, uh, again, similar set of corrections to get them square and cleaned up. And um, sometimes there was glare in the way, you know, any kind of number of problems dealing with the, um, a three-dimensional object compared to the print. Um, but nice we were able to show this detail as well. And then uh, from there, luckily, uh, everyone loved the prototype, as I recall. So um, we jumped straight into um, developing it on the Hamilton site. And this is just a screenshot of what it looks like today. Um, we got great uh, assistance from uh, the Shopify folks to um, build it out and gave Paul and I and everyone else an interface to upload assets, basically, um, which I didn't screenshot. Maybe that would have been interesting. But um, it was a process of uh, taking all the different images we had digitized, spinning out all these different combinations, like I said, and uploading them and labeling them and organizing them in the back end of this Shopify portal so that uh, they all go into this interface like you see. Yeah, let me make a quick note. So again, as we're developing the prototype, it was about at the prototype stage when you saw the XD slide in the timeline. That's when we were working with Bill and we were trying to make a decision of how we were going to implement this. And it turns out that Shopify was a workable platform. It was economic. Um, the components were there that we needed. And, and Hamilton has a great... Um, uh, Shopify engineer. So we talked with him about what we wanted to do and it all came together pretty quickly. And the advantage is that's a content management system that allows uh, anybody who's got some initial training to interact with and add content. So we, in doing this, uh, sometimes we wanna remove me from the process uh, so that other people can do this and upload. And we're trying to dock it. We, we've made a good effort at documenting the process and the steps we're doing so that if ever we need to do this, other people can use this process and upload content. Yep. So having said all that, um, I'll try to get through this last section pretty quick so that we can get onto some Q&A. Yep. Um, but we can spend a little time talking about the sort of what we call the significance and utility having built this. Um, some of it's obvious. It, it's a great simulation of the printing process, especially for novice visitors who maybe uh, have a hard time getting their head around it. Um, it's kind of a fun way to play around and experience um, that process. Um, but we discovered, and I'm gonna go into this in a second, um, it had a kind of an interesting proofing uh, mm -hmm. capability that kind of educated us about some ways that ink is interacting and how it's stacked up and ordered. Um, and of course it's, in theory, it's something that could be used for digital, what we call digital restrikes, which is, you know, really just creating um, a new image that's purely digital and is, doesn't have to be printed on a press every time. Yeah, we realize, you know, we, we do want to keep in mind what Hamilton is as a, as a museum and institute, a working museum. And it, it, we start, now we're kind of entering this sort of hybrid area of digital, digital imagery and analog imagery. And um, you know, how should Hamilton treat that? So we're in the beginning stages of that. And as we were developing this, we really started seeing you know, the significance and utility of these things. Um, in some ways, you know, I'm sure somebody is gonna make a comment here about vectorizing what we're doing. And in a sense, you could create a, uh, a surrogate cut at some point, even if you were to integrate that digital file into a, um, um, somebody help me out here, a, um, a routing system, um, a CAD system. Somebody jump in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Huh? Go, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry, crosstalk there. All right. Well, so let's uh, let's uh, look at this. This is um, yeah. Let's move on. Okay. Yeah. Just just a quick example of the kind of thing we're talking about. Here's um, again an image of a print that we received and subsequently digitized. We got um, separation prints as well, so it all went into the system. Um, as we were uh, doing that, we uh, noticed something interesting about it. Uh, on the left here is uh, sort of a detail from the original print. But when we were looking at the separations, uh, we noticed on this yellow print, there were these dots. They're not visible in the print we were looking at. So we were thinking, why are these uh, dots here? You know, what, what, what's their point? We can't see them. And it didn't take us long to realize this was a result of how the ink had been laid down. Um, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about um, print uh, uh, ink color um, sequence. Uh, yep. Go ahead, go to that next slide, Christopher. Yep. So here's what happened. Uh, on the left is, I assume, I, I think we confirmed this with Jim at the time as well. What we were looking at was that the red had been laid down on top of the yellow, which is probably the most intuitive way to do it. Right. But we realized the intention of the woodcut more likely was that yellow being uh, somewhat translucent was meant to go on top of red and create uh, a, a new orange color for some of these details. Yeah, and you can see, I, I don't, I, I, hopefully you can see, if you look at the lanterns on the left and the right, you have a, uh, and look at the dots in the lantern, you'll see that the, um, there's an orange circle, an inset with red, and that informed us of the print order. Um, a little, you know, it was just interesting that we were looking so carefully at this because we're looking at the two differences between our digital version and what the restrike print was. And that's when we started, we're able to quite easily change the layering um, and, and therefore kind of digitally proof it. And uh, we thought that was a really interesting discovery because it brings up issues of ink transparency and it brings up issues of ink um, uh, sequence as well. And so now we have the digital process maybe helping us in a sense as a proof process prior to getting on the press. Now I'm saying that maybe Jim would disagree with that. Um, and, uh, but we did see a utility and that's kind of what we're talking about here. It's a, it's a very good point, Paul. And I think that if, you know, if you go back to the first image you showed of uh, Jimmy Lynch, we ran that in what you'd consider traditional uh, methods where we went uh, yellow, blue, red, black, or something like that. And we realized that much like ASCA here, it really did not produce the intended effects. And in fact, it was blocking things out because of the direction we ran it. And we also know that those printers were really, um, for the most part, never using transparent inks. Therefore, the, the progression of color is critical. Now, in a small sense, uh, it's not that difficult for me to play around with those colors, but someday we will want to print a billboard. And I would much rather you gave me the sequence than me running uh, eight two sheet blocks in the wrong colors, you know. Um, but <laughs> another point um, which uh, uh, supports that is I recall you asking for the gray rhino separation. Uh, the initial one was not dark enough. And I didn't really want to run it again because it looked like someone had spilled varnish on it and it was in horrible condition. But now that you've created the good separation, I can make a substitute block and reprint it to the way it was intended. So, I mean, those are just two things that, that would aid everything. Yeah, and it's interesting that, so this is that utility we're talking about. Here we are, we're developing, remember the original uh, premise was to develop a, uh, an implementation of being able to show some of the assets of the Hamilton Museum on the website. And it's pretty fascinating that we got to really scope in and look at how these woodcuts were working and what the designs were. Um, let's, we've got a couple really cool slides here that 
are right along this line that we can also use as examples. So let's let's get to those if we can, Christopher. Yep. Yeah, that's good. We can wrap it up after that. Um, yep. Yeah. Here, here's obviously the before and after, and you can see um, the the presence of so much of this orange color once we um, made that change, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but we found that this uh, effect seemed to apply to some other uh, pieces as well. Um, here are three examples of this sort of um, technique of putting the yellow on top of the red to create something different. Um, even in this, uh, the carriage horse at the bottom, there was a green color that came from uh, putting yellow on top of the blue, um, which is pretty interesting. But you can see here, um, I've separated out just the, the yellow on top of the red so you can see what's happening. Um, the football one's interesting because it's kind of a dirty print, but, um, and a darker effect, you know, you want that sort of football leather effect, but um, it's present in all of them. Yeah, and and it was interesting because these were these things, especially like the bumper of the Jimmy Lynch car was a difficult thing to see. Christopher and I went back and forth saying, hey, I think you're missing a detail on this, on this bumper and the fender. And uh, we kind of went back and forth. Um, and in a sense, it's time consuming, but it's also like super interesting. Um, and then it's great to digitally see, remember in Photoshop, you can create transparent layers as well. So you can do an intermixing of color again. Now this brought to issue what I said before, um, since we have things separated, we could even in a digital version, put a paper texture. And we went back and forth, I think over a week about whether we should do that or not. Um, so, you know, how true do we want to stay to the original? How much is this a digital artifact or a digital object? Um, that was kind of an interesting thing. And as it turned out, our version of football looked uh, quite a bit different than Jim's print. And he's done restrikes. And I think these are available um, at Hamilton to buy. And our browns look quite a bit different. So that started bringing up issues of, well, what color should we be using? What is our reference? Um, should we be trying to completely emulate the vintage or the restrike print? So those are all, I'm not going to answer those um, other than to say these are all issues that came up. So it's a sort of a nice kind of natural but new realm for us. Yep. And and that's that's all we have. Um, I know Paul um, has some wrap-up comments, and um, hopefully we can whip through those and get right to Q&A. But um, thanks yeah. for listening. Yeah, I've, I've tried to sort of integrate my conclusion, my concluding remarks in my sort of commentary when I'm interjecting um, over Christopher. Um, but as I said, you know, it's just an interesting thing now that we have this hybrid. I, I'm trying to glance at the comments people have there. Um, there's been some interesting comments and I, I, I haven't been able to focus on both. So we'll get to some of those questions. Um, but, you know, it really, I think the broadest thing, we'll answer those questions, but something to think about and maybe part of discussion, we're not going to have tons of time, but really, how, how can and should these digital images be used? There's obviously lots of um, applications for this. Um, but again, we have to ask the question, how does it fit into a working museum such as Hamilton that's sort of an analog? We don't want the two systems competing and yet there's a real validity to digital restrikes in some respects. So that's a question. Now I'm raising that question. These haven't been big discussions at Hamilton or anything as of yet. But it's just kind of interesting that we've gotten to this place just by developing this interface. So I'm going to stop and uh, let's address some questions. Um, Paul, if I might uh, add something there. Um, uh, as, as we get into that discussion of, of the two ways of doing it, it might be good for people to understand that when we acquired this collection, uh, we got 700 posters from them, maybe 300 unique ones, and probably, what, 30,000 blocks. So generally speaking, we have no clues to the true color of a given piece. And so just from my perspective at any rate, is that when you look at certain pieces, what I'm attempting to do initially is to recreate it as it was. We can always vary as we go down the line, but 
um, you know, which is why sometimes I didn't want to begin printing a four color piece by varying one of the colors because when they're dyed that color, I have a better clue as to what the intent was. Jimmy Lynch becomes one of the best examples. I have scanned hundreds of images on the internet without finding that print. And so the color scheme, I would like for the integrity and the history of the blocks. That said, um, as we experiment with a, a digital approach toward recreating it, the results are obviously pretty marvelous. So uh, both can succeed. I just figure I kind of need the historic end before I um, diverge into what it could be. So we have some amazing questions and I wanted to make sure that you guys could get through everything. So I'll start by asking some of those if that works. Okay. Um, some go all the way back to the beginning, but I think are really good questions, especially Jim the printer, Paul and Christopher. So um, Craig wanted to know, is there a possibility of using anything like registration marks on the paper prints that would help with the geometric corrections of the photos as you were doing that work? Jim, I saw that you kind of responded to that um, in the chat section. Do you want to offer your comment? Um, sure. There, there are times where that would be possible. Um, a number of these are what we call a one-sheet poster, meaning they are 26 by 40. And generally speaking, I can't even get paper that is bigger than 26 by 40. So there isn't any room without say cutting away the block to put that uh, registration mark in. There are things that we can do to try and uh, improve that. And certainly on the smaller ones, you can do it. Um, so, you know, there, there are solutions, but a lot of times there's just no room on a, uh, on a piece of wood for adding anything into the corners that would be uh, registration marks. So typically if I talk to a paper company, I'm asking them when they're gonna start making um, 30 by 44 inch paper specifically for me and never is usually the answer I get. Let me jump in there and say, certainly um, um, we could add a registration mark to the photographic process to use that as an alignment. But we have a lot of visual references to do our alignment. And again, we're doing our best in our photographic technique to make sure that the camera, uh, as it's called, the lens plane and the film plane is perfectly parallel to the actual art object. Um, I know we got other questions, so I'm just going to leave it at that. That sounds good. I think it's interesting hearing there how the real world comes against the like um, thought process as you guys plan. Mm. Uh, another good question along that line is uh, Terrence wanted to know, knowing the grand size of these, would it be too much to try scanning these in large pieces and merging the pieces in Photoshop, leveraging the software, stitching the pieces together? I thought about that. Um, and I would have liked to try it. I, my suspicion is it would have been more trouble than it was worth. Um, I was kind of surprised by how uh, by the quality we got um, through the process we had, which was, you know, photographing the whole thing um, and uh, getting a nice high resolution image from that. But um, like, I, I would still love to try uh, maybe printing a small piece that would fit on a flat bed scanner just to, I mean, it would certainly help with the, you know, registration and geometry stuff. And that would be a cool experiment to try. I'm not sure stitching together would be uh, feasible though. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, with smaller pieces, certainly. Um, and I, too, am surprised at what we're able to get from the photographs. And we're always working to improve that and trying to make corrections and make that process easier. So any steps we can make to make the entire process from start to finish, the workflow more efficient, we're looking at it. And I think there was some talk of getting a big scanner, but they're expensive. And while we have many sponsors, um, sometimes it's not always feasible. Well, and I think that looking at this project, if you were, um, if you were going to say, how can we make the whole thing more complicated? Um, you'd say, well, let's put 
Paul and Christopher in California and let's put <laughs> Bill in Minneapolis and then add in a pandemic so that they can't come to the museum and actually see the pieces that they're working on. It, uh, it, uh, it brought in a lot of natural difficulties, I think. And we exchanged many emails, phone calls and Zoom meetings, but I think it was, uh, it was tough on those guys because they were trying to do so much work without being uh, next to the pieces. And um, it was a little difficult on this end because I wasn't seeing what they were seeing. So. We, we can fix it just by getting those two guys into the museum. So that, that's the intent now. You guys are moving to two rivers, I heard, right? That's... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so uh, Zen had a great question. She said, uh, and this might not be really an answer, just a thought, that would there be any digital print production workshops with Hamilton? I think the knowledge you guys have, um, you know, maybe if we can consider sharing it more, it might be really exciting. Uh, Hans also said, have you guys considered choosing a poster and let the, oh, this is an interesting thought on usability at the user end. Have you guys considered uh, choosing a poster to let the web user experiment with their own color choices for each block? Oh, indeed. Many, many conversations exactly about that, Hans. Um, and the idea of, we, we kind of, we were debating whether to really bring this up because it could just go on its whole its own little path and that's the idea of um, well both both Christopher and I as you can tell are into music and so we appreciate remixes and so we're we, we obviously are embracing the idea of visual remixes uh, using components um, from different cuts um, um, and creating a unique piece of work and in fact, that came up quite early with Bill in that this is the idea. You remember I mentioned the word at the very beginning, tool. And we really, our first focus was on creating an interactive tool that people on the site could use and engage with the actual assets of the museum in a digital function. So that certainly is something we think a lot about. Um, but of course, again, that's the, the nature of the museum. How does that work with a functional printing museum? And how do we integrate the two? Um, those are conversations that I would love to have at some point, but right now we're concentrating on making the uh, collection available online. But uh, yeah, the idea of remixing and, and digital restarts is, a, is, is really intriguing, at least to me, as well as a lot of other people, I would think. I, I think thinking about the future of how it can be used is great. Um, and that it got in the hands of individuals to see our collection during a pandemic only means it can grow a lot from there. So that's really exciting. Um, this is a question for Jim. So I've left up all of on screen so no one gets sick from us moving around a lot. Uh, Jim, why didn't printers use transparent inks? You said that oftentimes originally when Inquirer was printing the posters, they were not using transparent. Do you mind just a little extrapolation on that? From the, uh, from the information I got from Mike Anderson at Enquirer, the, he said rarely was there uh, transparent ink available for them to use. You got opaque white, which you would thin without great results. But generally speaking, they, they kept things quite opaque and it was partly because they wanted to just pack the poster with color. And so the designs were not uh, very often uh, needing that because they felt that if you were layered properly, like Paul was saying earlier, with a horse, you, you can run yellow over red as your third color, as opposed to what we might normally do, which is to run yellow and then red later uh, that darkens it too much. I think truly they felt like they could control the results that they intended simply by uh, running their ink uh, properly, if you will, um, in the process. Um, to that point, an extension of that is Terence was asking when, I think this is more for Christopher and Paul, when you view the files in color layers, are you viewing the transparency to the colors as normal or multiplying the layers? We tried all sorts of things. Um, 
And it, it just varied per print uh, for some reason, if we were trying to match something we saw in, um, you know, an original print, uh, sometimes just trying to reproduce what we were seeing. It, it involved either just doing sort of a straight transparency layer or doing that sort of multiply layer to mention. So yeah, Photoshop lets you sort of combine layers in different uh, algorithms. And um, we just had to like try it and see. Yeah, we also tried to use that in order to pull, um, to take a woodcut that we didn't have a print of uh, at all, no vintage print, no restrike, and to see if we could actually pull the print surface area off that woodcut from the woodcraft cut photograph using different filters, um, a, um, a lot of techniques, um, layering techniques and layering filters. Um, and you can just spend so much time and we spend as much time as we possibly could, but we realized we had a end goal that, and, and, a, and a, a delivery date that we really wanted to meet. So yeah, you're, that's perceptive of you. And there are a lot of things that we can continue to experiment with. It's a matter of time. Okay. I think the, um, some questions have been answered in the chat, so I won't ask those, but I think the last good question, and then if anybody wants to unmute or raise their hand, they can. Um, but someone was curious about the thought of including a picture of each final printed poster along with the digital recreation in the gallery for comparison. Christopher? <laughs> well, I, I think that would be great. It's interesting. Sometimes it, it, uh, it can be a little different, like the tiger, actually. It was, it was almost mm -hmm. impossible to reproduce the look of the, of the press print um, digitally because um, it's so complex. But it would be cool, you know, and we didn't always have a nice clean print of, of what we were digitizing even, you know, it's, um, but to have everything together and present it on the site would be cool, I think. Yeah, yeah, but it also brings, yeah, I, I think it would be pretty interesting to do. Again, you have to think in terms of the interface and the real estate we have available on the interface um, um, and how much visual information you wanna present um, maybe that could be a link to a separate screen, a before and after kind of thing. Um, but it's all about that navigation and keeping, that's why I wanna go back to that analysis that we did of all the different websites. Things can easily get confusing, you can get lost. We wanted to keep things pretty straightforward. Um, some of those sites I analyzed were complex and um, um, that isn't something we wanted to do, um, but, there are certainly ways of expanding the interface to include a, a feature like you're suggesting. It's not a bad idea. Sweet. Um, well, I am going to say if anybody has any more questions, they can, um, they can ask. Also, we are building this and a large person of why we're building it is so people can use it and learn from it. So if you have thoughts, and I'm saying this as a museum person, I know Paul and Christopher have to balance what's possible, um, but we want to hear what you're intrigued to know about and what you wanna learn about and what you wanna see. Um, so uh, you know, if you can email info at woodtype.org um, because it is nice for us to know how you want to interface with parts of the collection. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'm gonna wrap it up. We've hit our hour. I cannot always promise the time of our speakers and presenters. So I wanna say thank you, Paul and Christopher. That was absolutely amazing. I loved to hear all the process. Also, thank you to Jim, because you had the, the, the printer portion of it. Um, so that all comes together to inform everybody about what we're doing and how we do it. Thank you, Hamilton. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will also uh, end with just a couple of things. These are possible, these ham hangs, these weekly events where we see all of you uh, because of our members. So thank you everyone who joined us for the call. And if you can consider becoming a member, it is how we open our doors. It is how we put on programming. So I've put a link over in the chat and thanks for everyone's support because I know we have a lot of members here with us today.